On today's episode of Locked on Cardinals, we're going to be breaking down some of the things Mike Schilt did well while he was a manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, some things he didn't do well while managing the Cardinals, and as well as some pros and cons of some of the managerial candidates that have been speculated around. So we'll be breaking down all those things on today's episode of Locked on Cardinals. You are Locked on Cardinals. Your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into Locked On Cardinals for Tuesday, October the 19th of 2021. I am Lucas Smith, host of the show at LJ Fastball's Twitter handle, which you can see right there if you're watching on the good old YouTube page. If you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, I thank you for tuning in today and listening to today's episode. And I thank you every day that you tune in, whether it's your first, second, last time listening to the show. Hope it's not your last time, but it's first, second, third, 100th time listening to the show. Thank you for tuning in, making Locked on Cardinals a part of your daily listening habits. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at LO underscore Cardinals. Email the show anytime at LockedOnCards at gmail.com. And like I mentioned, my Twitter at LJFastball. As I mentioned on yesterday's show, we're going to talk some pros and cons of some of the managerial candidates that have been floated about. Um, Skip Schumacher, Matt Holliday, Oliver Marmol, Stubby Clapp, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll also, before we get there, we're going to be talking a little bit more about Mike Schilt. Uh, if you have missed the news, if this is you just scroll upon this upon your podcasting, searches if you happen to fall upon this upon your pod or your youtube searches mike Schilt has been fired uh by the st louis cardinals and will no longer be managing them despite having one year left on his contract so we're going to kind of take a look back at his tenure uh, as as st louis cardinals manager one that, that started in an interim role and ended in a premature firing so definitely not an ideal uh tenure by mike Schilt, or at least in, you know for, for his term, his perspective. We're brought to you today by Rock Auto. They have amazing selection and reliably low part, part prices. Excuse me. Get all the parts to your car you will ever need. Visit rockauto.com. Let them know that Rock Locked On sent you. We'll be talking more about Rock Auto coming up here a little bit later on in the show. But let's go ahead and get right into the content. Talk about what Mike Schilt did well, what he didn't do well. Because there were some things on both sides. First and foremost, what he did do well, he brought this team back to the playoffs. You even look at it at his win record in, in his first year. He was 41 and 28 in the second half of 2018. The same team that Mike Matheny went 47 and 46 with. Mike Matheny had two 86, there's two sub 90 win teams in 2016 and 17, 86 and 83 respectively. Is that all on Mike Matheny? Is that entirely his fault? No, not by any touch of the imagination. And I'm not saying all the success that Mike Schultz has had is 100% Mike Schultz's fault either. Front office made some moves to get a Paul Goldschmidt, a Nolan Arenado. Uh, so there's no question about it that the team overall improved, but one could argue the manager did as well because in his second season, his first full one as a Cardinal manager, Mike Schultz went 91 and 71 and made the playoffs, clinching the National League Central Division on his on the last day of the season that year against the Chicago Cubs. Beat a very good Atlanta Braves team, one that not a lot of people thought that he would beat, that the Cardinals would beat, and then uh, got swept in the National League Championship Series. Um, but a playoff run is a playoff run. Next year after that, in a tumultuous, awful year of 2020, somehow found a way to motivate his players and to, to push the, the right buttons mostly to make the playoffs at a 30-28 and 28 mark, second in the National League Central, in the expanded playoffs and going three games against a very, very talented and exciting Dodger team at the time, but still a playoff run in a year where everybody was grinding. And there, there's two sides to every single coin, right? So the, the other side of this coin is that, well, he wouldn't have made the playoffs without the, the extended postseason. And I've brought up that point before, and that's, you know, a mostly valid point, and I understand that. But at the same time, the other side of the, you know, the side that I was talking about prior, he did make the playoffs in a very difficult year, the 17-day the layoff, the 11 doubleheaders that they played in a very short amount of time to come out of that on top, to come out of that with, with a playoff berth was pretty remarkable. And then this this most recent season, 
the team went on a historic 17 game winning streak. They, they played very well to close out the year. He goes 90 and 72, only one win shy of his previous high back in 2019, makes the playoffs, plays arguably the best team in the National League on paper, down to their final at bat, makes a questionable, questionable decision. And we'll talk about that coming up here in the second segment. But what he did well overall was that he brought a team that has not made, that had not made the playoffs since for three seasons, and then brought them to the playoffs for three consecutive seasons. Mike Matheny had some playoff success. He made the playoffs um, from from 2012, from his first year all the way to 2015, and just didn't make it the last three years of his managerial tenure. Mike Schilt made the playoffs the first three years and still gets fired because of, again, quote, philosophical differences. I talked about that on a couple episodes ago. So it, it's, it's, it is, uh, what am I trying to say here? It is vague is the word I'm trying to come up with. Excuse me. It's vague uh, why he was got fired, but it is what it is at this point. And we just, it, we have to move on, um, uh, move on and just kind of remember Mike Schultz is what he was. And that was a, a great man. And somebody that made the playoffs three years in a row. He, he brought winning baseball to St. Louis. Or he didn't bring it, but he, he was able to arguably bring winning baseball back. You know, over his four seasons as manager through a three, four, and one interim role, uh, he was 252 and 199 as a 559 winning percentage. And that was, that's, that's a very good four, four season run, three and a half season run. Uh, granted, you know, like I mentioned, he had an interim role in the second half of 2018 and a short in 2020. So the totals might not be as high as a normal normally would be in a three half year strand, uh, span, but nevertheless, that, that's a lot of wins. Mike Schultz was able to win baseball games at the major league level. He was as a manager, and again, once again, I do have to just make it clear that he is not the sole reason for a winning team, nor is any manager a sole reason for a losing team. Um, you know, nine and a half, nine point nine times out of ten. Um, but what Mike Schultz was able to do is is kind of bring back that cardinal way. Of, of the good defense, the good base running, doing the little things right. And again, some of that had to do with you brought in Paul Goldschmidt and you brought in Nolan Arenado, two of the best players in the game, two of the highly fundamental players in the game that focus on the fundamentals, that do the little things right. They do the base running well. They are ex- exceptional fielders, especially Arenado. Paul Goldschmidt, Gold Glover in his own right. So you have two guys right there that were brought in that helped Mike. That's also from the top down, from the coaching staff down, you have to be able to implement that philosophy. You have to be able to implement that standard of play. And Mike Schilt was able to reintroduce that. And you, you just look at the fielding percentage. In 2018, Mike Schilt took over half the year, but the Cardinals were dead last in fielding percentage with 978. Just three years later, 2021, you've got a 986 fielding percentage that was fourth in the National League that turned 137 double plays this season. And again, fielding percentage is not everything. There are a lot of deeper metrics. But you even look at the deeper metrics. You, you've got Tyler O'Neill, Harrison Bader, Dylan Carlson in the outfield. Those are remarkable players. You've got Tommy Evan at second base, who's a stud. Is he Colton Wong? Good, maybe not, but he's a stud. You've got Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt at the corners, studs. You've got a pitching staff that knows how to field their position for the most part. Adam Wainwright, Jack Flaherty. Jay Happ made some nice plays this season. And Yadier Molina is Yadier Molina. Metrics aren't always super kind to him at this age, at this point in his career. Still got a cannon for an arm, still throws out plenty of base runners. He was able to improve the defense, improve the base running. That's something that a lot of people thought was lost since Jose Okendo left, whenever he had to leave his role due to some uh, health issues. and uh, His back, I think, was what was bothering him. But Mike Schultz was kind of able to, to reintroduce that, to, to bring back the Cardinal way and he brought the Cardinals back to the postseason, somewhere they had not been in three seasons prior to Mike Schilt taking over. That's a huge positive. And another positive that was very big from the moment he, he took over, he won the players over. He was a player's manager. Does a player's manager always work out? No. Does a player's manager have zero discipline? No. Mike Schilt still had to discipline his players. I'm not saying that. But he was able to win the trust of the players. He was able to communicate with the players in a way that maybe Mike Matheny wasn't at that time of Mike Matheny's managerial career, but the players bought into what Mike Schultz had to say. Period. They were all in, and when you have a team that is all in, that is going to find at least some success. I'd rather have a mediocre team buy into a coach's philosophy and be all in for that than a really good team not buy into a philosophy, because then that that second team is probably going to struggle a little bit more than the other team is going to, and the other team that buys in is going to have more cohesiveness they're going to gel a little bit more together Mike Schultz was able to do that 
He communicated well with his players. His staff was, was a cohesive group. Mike Schultz did those things very well. You know why he did those things very well? He was a baseball man. Was he a perfect baseball man? Is he a perfect manager? Does he have? Does he arguably maybe have some more flaws than positives? Yeah, I can understand that. I can concede that argument. I get that. But at the end of the day, Mike Schultz has been around this game a long time. He knows what he's doing. He was able to turn a team around that hadn't made the playoffs in three seasons. He was able to improve the team defense um, in addition to getting some star players. He improved the team base running, and he was able to get the players to buy in. Players trusted him. Players were, were confident in, 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 in what he had to say and, in what, and how he went about a game plan. And that, that, that's huge. You have to have at the major league level, it's about having a culture of, of solid players like that. And that's exactly what, um, what Mike Schilt had at the helm. So those are some, some of the things that Mike Schilt did well. And because he did get fired, there, there were some things that he didn't do well because it, it, it's – I don't think it was just a philosophical difference. I think there is an argument to be said where it might have been some philosophical and some management philosophy or some management decisions that did not pan, pan out. So we'll talk about some of the things Mike Schilt did not do well, some of the negatives of his tenure coming up in just a moment. But as I mentioned at the top, we take our first break. We're going to talk about today's title sponsor, and that is Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now almost impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need why would you endure some pointless questioning, maybe even some intimidating questioning, while the person behind the counter looks at his or her computer and finds the brand and model that they happen to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket on your phone on the go. You can save time and money when using Rock Auto. You don't want to spend up to 100% more on auto parts. So go to the family business that's been doing it right for over 20 years. Rockauto.com prices are always reliably low for every single customer. They have Everything you could possibly need, whether it's a brake part, tail lamp, motor oil, or even new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to all of your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now to see all the parts available. And be sure to write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Rockauto.com. Go to and enter the locked on in their how did you hear about us box. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. So no manager is perfect. Uh, we, we know that even Tony La Russa, Connie Mack ha- had their flaws, right? Bruce Bochy had their flaws. Um, and, and Mike Schilt was no stranger to flaws. We're, none of us are stranger to flaws. I've got flaws. You've got flaws. We've all got flaws. Um, you're all still wonderful. Don't, 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 uh, don't, make, don't think I only think of your flaws. You're all wonderful. Um, but never, <laughs> nevertheless, Mike Schilt did have some flaws. One of his main flaws that could have been the cherry on top of the cake, of the reason he got fired was – his um, his bullpen management, his bullpen decision making. There's a very good argument to say that a manager is as good as his bullpen decision. There's an even better argument, in my opinion, that a manager could be as only good as his bullpen is. No matter how good you are at managing a bullpen, you still have to have a good bullpen. I remember the 2011 World Series DVD, which I happen to have right here at my desk. Um, Tony Russa talking in that it's not just so much about guys um, pitching well; it's about guys knowing their roles. Um, and having and him having the ability to go to certain guys in certain situations and trusting that they're going to get the job done. So sometimes Mike Schilt could have gone to, to different players in different times. And I understand that. Sorry, as the video refocuses on YouTube. Um, did he go to Alex Reyes too much uh, closer to the end of the year with, with runners on base? Absolutely. At, at some point, you, you've got to realize that Alex Reyes cannot be brought in with a runner on, or runners on base. It just can't happen. It rarely ever, if ever, ended well. You had the home run at Pittsburgh that he gave up. You had the home run at Milwaukee that he gave up. Earlier in the year, when he came in with the Cardinals at a 6-1 to lead to start the inning, Alex Reyes comes in with the bases loaded, and the Cardinals lose that game 7-6. to Was that solely on Alex Reyes? No. Did Mike Schilt put Alex Reyes in the best position to succeed? No. Even at Alex Reyes' height of dominance this season, it was clear that he had little control of his pitches. He was all over the place, but his stuff was that electric that it was able to play a little bit for most of the season, and he was able to be an all-star and have a very good season overall. But you've got to know, especially in a wild card game, you can't bring Alex Reyes in with a runner on base. You've got to find somebody else to go to. and it, You go to Flaherty, you go to Hudson, you go to, to another starter you know, you, you prepare yourselves for an extra inning. You go to another bullpen arm. You know, 
Uh, you, you just can't go to Alex Reyes in that situation. So bullpen management left a little bit to be desired, left a lot to be desired to some people. You know, he was able to get some no name or, or, or lesser known name reinforcements in TJ McFarland and Luis Garcia that helped him out t- a ton. There are, like I mentioned before, there are two sides to every coin. The other side of this coin is that he didn't have a lot of options m- middle of the year. It was Cabrera, Reyes, and Gallegos, and everybody else was a huge, enormous question mark. And that's a good argument as well, that maybe Mike Schultz didn't have very good options to start the year, so that's why his bullpen management suffered. I understand that, but you also, there are many times throughout the season where he seemed to leave a bullpen arm in too long or didn't warm up a Gallegos, a Reyes soon enough, or didn't warm up a Cabrera soon enough that then he didn't have any option but to leave the, that pitcher in and give up the tie and go ahead, winning run, whatever it might be. Uh, and again, no manager is going to be perfect, but I thought that of the two big negatives that I'm going to talk about here, the bullpen management struck out to me because there are certain times where it's just a head scratcher. And, and credit to Mike Schilt, he always had an answer. He, I feel like he always defended himself when the opportunity was given, when the media had a question, hey, why'd you go this way? Why'd you go that way? Uh, there were a couple of times where he got heated. I understand that. I mean, when you get asked the same question over and over again, it can get frustrating. But also, you know, you could argue that if he made quote unquote better decisions or got better results, he wouldn't be asked that same question over and over again. All these things apply. All these things are true. Um, but I, I think that he always had a defense for an argument. It was never, well, this is what we've got. That's what I went with. He was always cordial. He was always respectful. There's another respectful. Said that a lot recently in the last couple episodes. Uh, but Mike Schell definitely, the bullpen management left some room to be desired. Uh, you, th- there there was a time this, this season when Giovanni Gallegos, who, in my opinion, won the reliever of the year for the Cardinals. That was on an episode last week, uh, last Friday. He he overused Gallegos and Gallegos' arm got cooked. Uh, and it was it was I don't know if it was ever officially a dead arm period, but his stuff just wasn't there and it looked like it was a dead arm period that he uh, that he just had a dead arm because he was overused. Some of that was Mike Schilt having to go to him more frequently than Mike Schilt wanted to. Some of that was poor management. Both things are are true. Uh, another negative that the other negatives that, that I'm going to talk about for, from Schilt is lineup construction. I think that Mike Schilt is somebody that trust his players a ton. He gives his players the benefit of the doubt a lot of the time. And that is in part why he was able to get the trust, get the buy-in from the players. And I understand that. I recognize that. I just talked about that as a positive in segment number one. But you also have to realize when, when players are slumping, players are slumping. So here, here's the two sides to this coin. Number one, I think he trusted Matt Carpenter way too much in 2021. I think he trusted Paul DeYoung way too much in 2021. And to be honest, I think he trusted Yadier Molina way too much in 2021, batting DeYoung and Molina 4-5 in the lineup at times before O'Neill got hot. So that's that's number one side. He trusted those guys way too long to be in the lineup. Number two, the other side of that coin, there weren't a whole lot of better options because you can tell me what you want about Yadier and Molina at this age. You're not starting Andrew Kisner over Yadier and Molina in 2021. just wasn't going to happen. Uh, at the time, we you didn't know what you were going to get from Edmundo Sosa. When you got more playing time, you saw the results. He was very solid at shortstop. Glove a little bit short, um, no pun intended, but uh, not not him. Uh, just the pun was shortstop. Uh, the bat w- was very solid. Was it the same power that DeYoung had? No, but it was very solid. Um, and then beyond Matt Carpenter, didn't really have a lot of bench threat. Lars Newtbar provided a little bit later on in the, in the season as the fourth outfielder. But early on, you had a, a rotating door of, of Justin Williams. You had Austin Dean early on in that season as, as the extra outfielder. So you, you, you just didn't really have a lot of options off the bench. So you had to go to Carpenter more often than you might want to. So some of it was the lack of options. But as I mentioned, the negative for me is the overall lineup construction, sticking with, with the same lineup over and over again for way too long um, or not giving somebody enough chance. I mean, it, again, it, it's a nitpicking thing because it's all based on results. No matter what a manager jo- does, whether it's lineup construction, who's my starting rotation, who's my closer, who's going to go in in this situation, they're going to get judged based off of the result. If it's a quote-unquote bad mood, mad move at the time, the broadcasters might talk about it, and then whatever the result on the field is, that's what we talk about. Oh, excuse me, that's what we talk about the next day. Oh, Mike Schilt went to Gallegos. Gallegos gave up, gave up a home run. Maybe he should have gone to X, Y, Z. Now there are certain points where it's it's obvious, but he's going to get judged on the results. The results during the 17-game winning streak were fantastic. Don't touch a thing if it's winning that way, right? If it's working like that, there's no reason to touch a darn thing. But the lineup construction, batting Molina so high up in the order, uh, maybe having – again, he didn't really have a true leadoff hitter. Tommy Evan did, did fine, but the on-base just wasn't there for me for a long-term leadoff hitter. But 
the, the big two flaws in my mind from, from my perspective, where I sit, where I, or how I watch the game, the two negatives that I have for Mike Schilt are the bullpen and the lineup construction. I think his bullpen management could have been a little bit better. And I think his lineup construction could have been a little bit better. That said, I do agree with him that he left this organization in a very good spot. Uh, we now know what we're going to get, or we have a better idea of what we can get from a Harrison Bader, from a Tyler O'Neill, even from a Dylan Carlson, from a fielding standpoint. We have a better idea of what we're going to get from a Paul Goldschmidt, from a Nolan Arenado. Tommy Edmonds' role has kind of been a little bit more defined. Um, now the next step for the manager, for the organization rather, will be to find a manager that can gel all those guys together again. What additions are going to be brought in? Who are you going to call up? What are you going to do with a Nolan Gorman, a Matthew Librator, and Ivan Herrera? That's the next manager's job. I think Mike Schilt was prepared to, to kind of take that transition, whether he wanted, you know, maybe, maybe the, one of the philosophical differences was Schilt wanted Gorman to be brought up and move Edmund to short, and Mosellock doesn't want that. I don't know. That's, that is, that's complete speculation um, as to what Mosellock or Schilt want. But, but maybe that would have been one of the philosophical differences, and maybe that's going to be something that John Mosellock and company look at when they're looking at their new manager. And with that said, we're going to have a new manager next season uh, for the St. Louis Cardinals. And there have been some names floating around that I, that I really like. There have been some that I kind of struggle with, but we're, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about some pros and cons about those um, managers coming up here in segment number three. And I, I, I mentioned these odds yesterday um, on the show because uh, it, was, it was brought up on the candidates based on betonline.ag, which is a nice, um, uh, wonderful sponsor. We'll have to be talking about them in just a moment. Um, but the, that's where I get these list of names, and I'll give you my, my kind of pros and cons a little bit more in-depth than we talked about yesterday. So uh, we'll talk about the, the list more in-depth than we did yesterday coming up in just a moment, and then we'll get wrapped up. Uh, before we do talk about that, we're going to be talking about Bet Online, as I mentioned Bet Online is back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of basketball season, which starts uh, the next couple of days. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all basketball and football action this upcoming season. Head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus for signing up on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on L O C K E D O N to receive that bonus from basketball, football, baseball, postseason, NHL, boxing, UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers for the 2021 season. Again, the promo code to get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit is locked on L O C K E D O N. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports. Bet online is where the game starts. Cardinals, we're looking for a new manager, most likely one that has philosophies more in line or maybe even exactly in line with John Mozalak. But again, this was tweeted out by Brian Walton on Wednesday, um, or excuse me, on Friday. And uh, I'm going to go through, go through this list overall one more time. We got Stubby Clapp, is, and th- these odds come from Bet Online. Stubby Clapp, three to two. Skip Schumacher, four to one. Mark McGuire, 23 to four. Buck Showalter, 13 to two. Oliver Marmol, 15 to two. Joe Espada, 8 to 1. Jose Okendo, 10 to 1. Bruce Bochi, 11 to 1. Brad Osmus, 12 to 1. Matt Holiday, 12 to 1. And Jeff Bannister, 14 to 1. You got some guys here with managerial experience. And I think that that's going to be a key for John Mozilla because the last two people that he has hired have had zero managerial experience at the major league level. That said, I don't think I'd be happy with a Buck Showalter or maybe even a Bruce Bochi. I think. I'd be happier with, with Bruce Bochy just because of the more success Bochy had, but I don't know if Bochy's going to have any interest in coming back. Uh, but Buck Showalter, I think, similar to Bochy, his managerial days are just over. Uh, I think that I think that they're going to be looking for a little bit more of a new school kind of player or kind of kind of manager, a little bit more maybe with with analytics. Uh, you, you know, so, some people have been talking about the, the negative side of analytics, but I just think that. Uh, a feasible thing in my mind of what some of those philosophical differences were of, of Mike Schilt being a little bit more old school and maybe the front office maybe wanted to go a little bit more analytical. Uh, could be, or could be vice versa. Who knows, right? But I think that they're going to be looking for maybe somebody a little bit newer, a little bit younger maybe. So we'll start with, with, with Skip Schumacher. I was a bench coach or uh, some, some sort of a bench coach with, with the San Diego Padres. I would be... I'd be fine with Skip Schumacher. He doesn't have any managerial uh, experience at the major league level. 
But maybe the Cardinals and Padres pull a swap with Skip Schumacher and Mike Schill. Obviously, unofficial. They won't be trading coaches, but un- you know, unofficially, a-, a swap there could be kind of interesting. I think Schumacher is one of those players that you knew when he was playing that he was going to be a coach or a manager someday. And I think it would be full circle for Skip Schumacher to come back and, and be a manager. I think that he would have success. I-, I-, I think he'd be a player that players can kind of rally behind. He seemed to be that kind of guy in San Diego. Uh, similar w- with Matt Holiday, another former Cardinal player. He's been a hit- hitting coach at Oklahoma State last couple of seasons, or a couple of years, rather. And he mentioned in a radio interview that anybody would be stupid not to consider a manager position with the St. Louis Cardinals, and he would love an interview. I think he'd be great, because I think we would see maybe a little bit more passionate side of Matt Holiday, because Matt Holiday was always kind of this quiet, reserved guy that when he needed to, he showed emotion, you know, got excited and all these different things. But I think Matt Holiday would be kind of a similar to Mike Schultz in the sense of standing up for his players, standing up for his guys, um, and kind of being that, that hard-nosed guy, come in, do your work, and get out. Uh, you know, he, he wouldn't worry about any of the extracurricular stuff. He, he would go in, do the job, and then get out. I think that Matt Holliday would be, would be excellent. Brad Ausmus did not have a lot of success with Detroit when he was managing. Also did not have a ton of success in his one year managing the Angels. So I, I'm not really a fan of, of Brad Ausmus. But Mark McGuire is an interesting choice as well when you're looking at somebody with, with past coaching experience, not manager experience, because Mark McGuire did have some success while in St. Louis as a hitting coach. He was a hitting coach when the Cardinals won their World Series championship in 2011. Worked a lot with David Fries. And then Mark McGuire left. You saw Freeze kind of go down a little bit. Uh, obviously, still had a very fine career, but you have to wonder uh, how integral was Mark McGuire in unleashing some of that potential um, and in working with mechanics and, and philosophies of hitting. Um, but again, Mark, Mark McGuire would have to do more than just hitting coach, obviously. Um, other names on this list, Oliver Marmol and Subby Clapp. Two, two internal guys. I think that Jeff Albert might have a shot as well. But Oliver Marmol is somebody that Mike Schilt mentioned by name that he has his utmost respect. And Oliver Marmol might do the same thing that Mike Schultz did, go from a bench coach and then straight to a manager's position. And I think that if you do that, that that really begs the question as to what were the philosophical differences. That would be a con to Oliver Marmol because you have to think that Marmol and Schultz have very similar, if not the same, philosophies. So if Mosellock wants to fire Schultz but hire Marmol, it makes you wonder why. It makes you wonder, was it really a philosophical difference or was it something deeper? Um, and then uh, – Jeff Bannister was the other name that I hadn't talked about yet. Former manager or the Rangers had some success, not not a whole lot. Uh, he was the one that was talking. Didn't like the 3-0 swing that Tatis took. You can have your own opinions on that. But uh, Stubby Clapp, similar pros and cons to Oliver Marmol. Um, Clapp has had a lot of success at the minor league level with Memphis specifically. Um, so he has manager success at the professional level, just not at the major league level. Uh, but I think that any one of those candidates would have some positives. Um, some of them have more negatives than others. I'm still not decided on who I want. I think Skip Schumacher is an is an intriguing choice, as well as Matt Holiday. Very intriguing. I think you could you could get some positives out, out of those two. But no matter who it's going to be, like I mentioned, they're going to have to try and navigate out of this somewhat awkward situation that we sit in right now as people who follow and watch the Cardinals as to what kind of what side we, we, we might want to choose between Schilt and ownership. So they're going to have to kind of navigate that. They're going to have to navigate. Who do we keep after this team kind of rose out of nothingness to make the playoffs? Who do we move on from? Who are we going to call up? And again, that's what even Mike Schultz has to deal with that. But those are kind of the pros and cons that I see of those managerial candidates. So if you have any extra thoughts on who you, who you think are some positives and who you think are, are some negatives, let me know. Um, and, and we'll uh, have a discussion on that. You can follow me on Twitter. DMs are open at LJ Fastball. The show and Instagram uh, show on Twitter and Instagram is LO underscore Cardinals. You can email the show anytime at LockedOnCards at gmail.com. That's going to do it for today's show. A lot of managerial talk last couple of days. I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it, talking about Schilt. Sadly, it uh, has to be in a, a negative tone with uh, the firing, but he did do some good things, and I was glad I got to talk about some of those positives on today's show. Uh, so come back tomorrow. We'll have more Cardinal content. Also, we'll be doing a little bit more of a postseason breakdown on tomorrow's episode, so be sure to tune in for that. And uh, we'll also get some Cardinal content, doing some updates on Arizona Fall League numbers and things of that nature. So be sure to come back for that. But until I talk to you guys then, be sure to stay safe, stay well, and have a fantastic rest of your day.